many of you are really good at giving praise? I'm not talking about to God. I'm talking about to other people. <laughs> Showing appreciation, affirmation, encouragement. How many of you have a challenge with that? <laughs> it's, it's harder to give encouragement, praise, appreciation. Uh, and, and the one, yeah, please don't raise your hand on this one. How many of you think you need more praise, encouragement, and things? <laughs> I said, don't. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm convinced that my sons know I love them. Uh, they did something pretty special for us in giving us this money for us to go to Israel. And, and incidentally, we're going to get to see where Jesus was probably baptized. We're going to get to see the places where he walked and where he taught and all. Because we're going to be in Israel in about two weeks. And uh, so we'll, we'll come back and tell you a little bit about that. Um, as soon as I start giving you too much, you just have to tell me, all right? <laughs> but, um, but, but our boys, and when, when they were giving us the gift, and they had some fun with this, and they gave us wads of money and stuff. I mean, it's incredible. It was all brand new dollar bills and $10 bills and stuff. And it was their way of saying, look, we love you. We want you to do something for yourselves. It was in honor of our 40th anniversary. I think it's our Christmas presents for the next 20 years. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but they said, look, we believe. Sorry, I might get emotional. <laughs> We believe you deserve this. This was an expression from them of their love. Hey, I don't know if you've watched Bill and Debbie, but we're not, oh, we're not always just nice and gentle. I mean, we know how to say no. And we said no over the years. And, and I coached Tim and Philip both, which meant even a more greater challenge for each one of them. And there are all kinds of experiences on yet. The thing that we've seen is that they know that we love them. It's interesting, um, I was at some meetings this last couple of days, and throughout the meetings, it was a training for the course that I, you've seen uh, fly, uh, some information about it. I've had it in the bulletin, it's up on the screen. We're getting ready to try to do some ministry with people who are, who are financially stressed and stretched and maybe even in danger. Uh, anybody here fit, fit that bill? Most of you don't. I'm surprised. So, you know, therefore, if you're all well, independently wealthy, you're hiding some money, okay? So, <laughs> uh, it's, it's for people who are also, in fact, they've, they've really tried to focus on the people who are uh, even low income. Like a lot, a lot of the financial trainings are really focused on people who are middle income, cut up your credit cards, uh, you know, because you've got all, all, you know, all kinds of strung out debt and all. Well, for, for a lot of people who are not independently wealthy, who, who are not middle class, who are financially challenged, they don't have credit cards. Uh, they pay most things with cash and oftentimes they give away lots of things that they have and they'll share with other people and they're financially maybe in trouble. And so, uh, but as a, one of the key things that kept coming out in the training, we had various kinds of experiences where different ones of us were supposed to lead sessions and we did it as groups and all. And constantly it was, yay, congratulations, thank you, good job, showing appreciation. Now for me, I'm not one who constantly stands up there, yay, Carol, good job, thank you. Because sometimes it feels like contrived, right? <laughs> And, and can go overboard and uncomfortable. And, and I always want my appreciation simply to be thank you. And, and I mean it. When I say thank you, I mean thank you. Um, but but it, it's, it's when, have you ever seen this? Oh, oh please don't tell me that. Please, please don't praise me anymore. But the other hand's <laughs> doing this. Right? Here's the, here's the fact, though, is that all of us like encouragement, don't we? Some kind of positive affirmation, don't we? Well, this morning, as we look at Jesus' baptism, we are going to see something amazing because God affirms his son so that others can hear it and even see it. God is literally praising his son and saying to him, oh, good. Oh, thank you. Good job. I've, I've wondered about this text and, and been asking myself questions. So why did Jesus get baptized? 
you remember that we started out in uh, Mark 1 and we're in our series right now on making disciples. And the goal of being disciples is to follow Jesus Christ, to become more like him. And, and the com great commission is, is that we are supposed to go and do the same thing. Matthew 28, 18, 19, and 20, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus is saying this. He's on a mountain. He's just about to ascend back into heaven. It's his last instructions to his disciples, his followers who have been with him for now some three years. The key people that he's really been training. Yes, he taught the crowds and the multitudes and all, but the people that he really worked on were those who were going to take his his ministry and share it after he left. Continue it. It was so significant. The process was so successful that the gospel spread literally around the known world. It's amazing what, what happened. Even in the midst of severe persecution, Christians being burned at the stake, burned on tor torches, alive, all kinds of things, and sent to the Colosseum sometimes. I mean, there was nasty stuff done to Christians, and yet, and yet, the kingdom of God grew and people came to know and believe in Jesus Christ. It became so far reaching that eventually Caesar himself, Constantine, actually accepts Christ. Now some of us would say when we look at history, that might have been a bad thing, not always a good thing. Well, let's put the bad part of it. The bad part of it is we suddenly made religion a state organization. Okay? It wasn't bad that Constantine accepted Christ, but historically it was bad because we started developing this thing of there's these people up here. They're the only ones who are allowed to know about God's stuff and the rest of you don't, don't read it because you'll mess it up. You know, you're going to misinterpret it. And, and we started developing this separation of what we call clergy and laity. And for centuries, we've gone through some process. And there's been pockets all throughout those, those centuries in there. Some of them are called the Dark Ages, you might remember. And there's periods of time where people are, where the church becomes so governmentally run in sense that it almost loses its spirituality. Yet there were always pockets of people that building relationships with Christ and sharing that relationship with others. And that's this process that we're called to, to go and make disciples. So why was Jesus baptized? You know, you, you look at John's baptism, in, and Mark 1 was describing it. And in John's baptism, it says that people were going out, the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John's baptism was clearly a baptism of repentance and forgiveness of sins. He was calling people, look, you need to get ready for the Messiah, and so confess. The best way to get ready for God is to confess. That would probably be a helpful tool for us even as we come on a Sunday morning, wouldn't it? <laughs> I mean, next Sunday, we're getting ready for communion. And, and Paul told us that when we prepare for communion, that one of the things that we should do is prepare our hearts, and we should examine ourselves. And the fact is, is that if we come here and we have problems in our relationships with somebody else, we may not take communion the way God wants us to. If we come here self-centered, focused on us, and we go to the table of communion, in fact, uh, well, here's what it was, it was really happening even in the church at that time in Corinth. They were actually going up to the table, eating and, and basically being pigs of themselves. <laughs> without taking time to think about anybody else, to serve anybody else. And it was just really, a, it was really a very self-centered attitude. Well, it, isn't that what happens when we have broken relationships with somebody? We're self-centered, aren't we? Here's a great one. If you sit there and wait for somebody to come to talk to you, Virgil, and every week you sit there just waiting for somebody to come to talk to you, somebody may come because we feel sorry for you. But wouldn't it be better for you to get up and go greet? Which incidentally, why did I pick on Virgil? Because that's what he does. <laughs> Probably several of you have already been greeted this morning by him. Okay, communion next week is about us preparing. And shouldn't we do what John the Baptist asked for the people to do? He says, look, repent, confess your sins, and get ready because the, the Messiah is coming. Okay, how many of you believe that Jesus is going to come again someday? How many of you say you don't know whether he's going to come again or not? How many of you say, oh, no, he's not coming again. He already did it, and he's done with it. Okay, well, actually, that's some of what the world has, right? Okay, so Jesus is coming again. Shouldn't we be getting ready for him? 
what would be a really good thing for us to do to get ready for Jesus to return. Well, I would suggest there'd be two quick things, and this is not the sermon, so I got to get back to my text, but there are two quick things that you should do. Number one is I would suggest confess your sin. Get ready for him to come. Number two, let somebody else know about Jesus. That's the whole process of making disciples. All right, now let's get to our text for this morning. It's just a couple of verses, really short, um, and I've actually cut it shorter than I thought I was going to. We're going to start at verse 9 of Mark chapter 1. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. And with you, I am well pleased. Incidentally, just a side note to this text, and this I did plan on sharing with you, so I'm not getting totally off track. Uh, This text may be one of the great Trinitarian messages in scripture. Do you, see the, do you see God the Father? God the Father is saying, look, this is my son. And he blesses him and he, and he praises him. But what also is present there? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes down, descends upon Jesus like a dove. And, and actually anoints him in a sense. And there's some incredible things that are going on here. But one of the things to recognize is this is the Trinity. This is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all at work at the same time. Isaiah 42, verses 1 to 8, kind of gives us a flavor of what John is looking for. John the Baptist has been given a responsibility to prepare the way for the Messiah. He's not sure who the Messiah is. John, in the Gospel of John, is going to tell us that the way he would know who who the Messiah was is that he would see heaven being opened up and the Spirit of God descending on him. Now, that's what John's told ahead of time. Has he known Jesus? Of course he's known Jesus. They're cousins of some sort. Have they been together? We don't know. We know that John's been living out in the wilderness for how long? We don't know. Could it be that his parents both died? They were fairly old when they gave birth to him. So maybe at some young age, John's been out there totally on his own, taking care of himself, eating locusts and honey to survive. Having his whole spiritual experiences out there in the wilderness, it says. So how much time did they have together? We have no idea. How much did Jesus understand about his whole mission as he was growing up? Well, he goes to the temple when he's 12, and what does he do? He, he discusses and teaches, actually, the, the, the authorities in the temple, doesn't he? He's got some recognition. In fact, he even says to his own parents, by the way, this is at bar mitzvah, isn't it? Which means this is at the time when he becomes what? An adult. That's a significant moment in a Jewish young man's life or a Jewish girl's life. They're no longer considered child. They're considered adult with adult responsibility. And so Jesus says, hey, mom, dad, didn't you know I'd be doing my father's business? And he he recognized it, that God has had something special on his life. What all he recognized? We really don't know. We know that Jesus, according to Philippians, emptied himself when he left heaven. What does that mean? He actually left a lot of glory there. And he forces himself into a human body to the confines of that body for some 33 years. Beginning in the womb of his mother and then until he grows up, he's confined to his, this body until he'll die on the cross. And at that moment, at the, after that death, he's no longer confined to that body, is he? He will then rise from the dead and will, he'll, he'll walk into rooms that are locked and shut down. He'll appear to people. He'll eat with them even. He'll drink with them. He sits along a beach with them. There's all kinds of experience. He walks and talks with them. And then he stands on this mountaintop and he says, guys, I'm leaving. Now you go make disciples. And then he ascends up into heaven. So this is an incredible body. It's changed, hasn't it? But during those first 30 years, we don't know exactly what. We just know that, that God was at work and he was preparing himself and the scriptures tell us he did not sin. And that is very important. 
So Isaiah, in, for John the Baptist, says, Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit on him. This is prophecy about what's going to happen with the Messiah. <clears throat> he will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Thus says God, the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Do you hear some of the prophetic words about Jesus the Messiah? In order to understand why Jesus was baptized, because did he need it? Um, see, this is the interesting point, isn't it? If John's baptism was all about repentance of sins for forgiveness, critics would say, <laughs> see, he was a sinner. That's why he had to get baptized. That's what critics would say. And they would love to take this text However, they want to stop the text with just, he got baptized. They have a problem with the rest of the text <laughs> because he didn't just get baptized, but the spirit of heaven, the heavens open up and the spirit descends on him and the voice of the Lord speaks out and says, this is my son whom I love. You see, to look at this text means dealing with something that's really, on one hand, you would think, oh, see, it makes it Christ, he's not the Messiah. He, he can't be because he obviously sinned and that's why he had to get baptized too. No. God's saying, no, he hasn't. He's done this for a variety of other reasons. We're going to see that in just a few moments. So in Luke 3, when we're going to look at a couple of the other texts where the baptism of Jesus takes place, incidentally, the baptism of Jesus is either spoken of in detail or referred to in all four of the Gospels. That kind of makes it a significant event, doesn't it? Makes it rather important. In Luke chapter 3, verses 21, 22, now when all the people were baptized, and there, that we, our estimates are that some 300,000 people were getting baptized out in the wilderness with John, so he had quite a following. When all the people were baptized and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened. And when he came up out of the water, excuse me, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove and a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Matthew takes just a slightly different twist to it. It says, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. This is chapter 3, verse 14. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you and do you come to me? In fact, the word there is, you know, I, John continually kept saying to Jesus, no, no, I need to be baptized by you, no. And yet you're coming to me wanting me to baptize you. John recognized something about Jesus, doesn't he? He said, but Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. It's an evidence that Jesus is righteous, Jesus is saying, and I need to do this publicly. And frankly, this is my act of obedience. And when Jesus was opened, excuse me, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. Incidentally, take note. Matthew is talking about it kind of in a third person over here. But John, excuse me, Mark and Luke are both speaking of it 
as, as Jesus hears it. Notice what God probably said is what's accurate in Mark and Luke. You are my beloved son. It's not God just talking about. This is incredible. It's God speaking to his son. Son, you're my beloved son. And I'm well pleased with you. And then he opens up heaven. The Holy Spirit comes down and ascends on him and blesses him. You see, why was, why was Jesus baptized? Well, I'll offer you a couple of options. One, <clears throat> Jesus was baptized to identify with John the Baptist's ministry. It's a way of him affirming John the Baptist. He's been out there preparing for the Messiah. In fact, John will go on baptizing people for another six months. He's been out in the wilderness for six. He'll be out there for an additional six. And then he gets to go to have his head cut off. Look at what John preached. Do you remember? In verses 7 and 8, Jesus came to John. The place his divine seal was on. John had been saying, John had been preaching to the people this message. The kingdom of God is at hand. The Messiah is coming. Jesus came to be baptized by John because he was saying, I am the Messiah, John. John 1 29 to 34. Why was Jesus baptized? So that John would know that Jesus was the Messiah. If you look at John 1 29, it says, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. How's that possible? John was born before Jesus, right? No. No. Jesus was from the beginning with no end. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin. This is of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. I myself <clears throat> did not know him. But he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. A day or so later, John will say one more time, And look at Jesus who walked by, behold, the Lamb of God. And his disciples will begin falling away. Well, actually not falling away. They go follow Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Why was Jesus baptized? Jesus is beginning his public ministry. He's 30 years old probably at this time. 26 AD or so, as we number the, the days. <laughs> Jesus is saying, it's time for me to start. And as a part of my affirmation of my beginnings of my ministry, he goes to John and he gets baptized. He does something he doesn't have to do. He does something he doesn't need to do. But he's going to say to the people, my job is now to obey this commission that my father has given to me. Isn't that what God's affirming when he says, this is my beloved son, I'm well pleased in him. Why? Because he just got washed? No, because he says, I'm going to do it. I'm now age of a rabbi. I'm at that legal teaching age. I'm at that age of maturity and responsibility. And it's time for me to begin my ministry. John's been preparing the way. I need to let John know I'm the Messiah. He's going to be going less. I'm going to be going more. And, and it's time for me to call the nations to life. It's time for me to declare why I've come. That I've come to give them life. And what is Jesus also doing, incidentally? Jesus is also giving us an example, isn't he? He's saying, look, I don't need to be baptized. But as, in order to signal the beginnings of my ministry, I'm going to take this step as an act of obedience. It's an act of humility. It's an act of humission, su submission. <clears throat> All those words we don't really like, right? Humility, obedience, and submission aren't those fun ones. Jesus says, I'm going to humble myself. And he humbles himself and he, and he leaves heaven and he leaves all the authority and the power behind. 
He says, I'm going to obey. I'm going to do what God my Father says. And he's going to do that throughout the entire journey. And with the final obedience, he goes to the cross and dies. Whoa. And I'm going to submit. I'm going to submit to the authority of my Father. When he could hang there on that cross and he could call down the angels, he chooses not to because he's going to submit for one purpose and that's to take away the sins of the world. So what does the baptism mean to Jesus? <clears throat> what Jesus is doing and he's saying, okay, Father, let's do this. <laughs> Remember the line? They're on the plane. A couple of planes, they don't know what all's going on, but planes are crashing into the World Trade Towers. There's a plane flying across Pennsylvania, and they know that the stewardess has already had her throat cut, and there's guys in the cockpit controlling that plane. And what does the guy do? And he says, they've, they've gathered together some of the other flight people on the flight, and they come on. The last thing he says to his wife, the young man, he says, let's do this. You got it. And they head up into the cockpit and the plane goes down in the ground. But it doesn't crash into the Pentagon, the White House, or a trade tower. And those men were ready to give their lives. And what Jesus is saying, it's time. It's time for me to do the ministry. And he's presenting himself. He's dedicating himself as he gets baptized Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And Jesus says, it's now time for me to give. John 18, 37, Pilate's questioning him right before he's going to allow him to be crucified. And he says, so you are a king? And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And moments later, Jesus will be sent to be beaten, tortured, whipped, and crucified. <coughs> You see, Israel had rejected the offer to be the blessing to the nations. So God says, I got a new plan. And it's a plan that really has been there from the beginning, and that's to send his son. For the Son of Man, Luke 19.10, came to seek and to save the lost. But there's another reason. Not only does he dedicate himself, but he also, another reason why, where are we on up there? What does God? I'm still under what does the baptism mean to Jesus? For Jesus, it's a demonstration of God. It allows Jesus to identify with the people he's about to save, doesn't it? He's saying, look, you all are sinners, and so I'm going to go through the waters of baptism because I'm taking this step to demonstrate I, I'm understanding the sin that separated you from God. <clears throat> Do you have, if you have your Bibles, turn to Mark 11. Mark the 11th chapter. Jesus is right near the end of his ministry. And he is going to point the religious people back to his baptism. Now let's ask why. In Mark 11, verse 27, it says that the, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders were looking for a way to trap Jesus. They, they, they really disliked what he was saying. In verse 28, it says, And they said to him, By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you the authority to do them? You're casting out demons, you're healing the sick, you're preaching and all. What's the authority? And, and who gave it to you? And Jesus will respond. I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? You answer me. <laughs> Um, I want to quote John MacArthur here for a minute. It was the baptism, wasn't it? 
where his authority was established. It was there that the Spirit of God came anointing him. It was there that the Father affirmed him verbally. It was there that he received full authority to act, authority to forgive sins, authority to determine truth and destiny. So you tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? That occasion when that occurred, believe me, that was talked about a lot. Was it legitimate? Let's continue in Mark chapter 11, verse 31. And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, then he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But shall we say from man? Well, they were afraid of the people, for they all held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus this way. We don't know. And Jesus said to them, Then neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Again, quoting from McCarthy, Jesus said, if, if you don't recognize my coronation, if you don't recognize the significance of my baptism, then the discussion is over. If you will not acknowledge that what happened at his baptism, the descent of the Spirit of God and the voice of God from heaven affirming me, if you will not acknowledge that, there is no other thing I can say about where my authority comes from. That's how critical the baptism is. It started right there. Have you thought about why Jesus gets affirmed by God at this moment? I mean, it's just a baptism, right? He could have done it when, they, when he turned the water in the wine, couldn't he? And that's kind of a miracle. That's almost more significant, isn't it? But why does God choose this moment? First off, it's incredible that God is going to insert his voice in the midst of that time and in the midst of history. And it can be heard, and John hears it, and John declares it, John the Baptist I'm referring to. And, and there's evidence that Jesus is actually hearing this as well. Why does God affirm Jesus at this time? Do you remember last week the word that we used for gospel? Euangelion. It's the evangel is another shorter way of saying that. It's the good news. But the, a euangelion was good news about the coronation of a king. What's this baptism? It's the crowning of Jesus. And God himself is coming to the crowning. David McKenna said, God not only anoints Jesus for service, but gives to his son the strength of identity, security, and confidence when he says, I claim you, I love you, I am proud of you. Jesus' credentials now include the affirmation of God the Father to go along with the announcement of John the Baptist. So what you have here is a divine affirmation that's out where everyone can see it. The Holy Spirit's going to come down. And why does the Holy Spirit come down like that? First off, Jesus has, not, has limited himself, hasn't he? And like us, he's human. And so the Holy Spirit's going to come upon him and empower him to do his work. And so there will be miracles and casting out demons and people raised from the dead and all kinds of incredible things that will happen because the Holy Spirit is with him, that same spirit that is with believers who accept Christ today. Isaiah 11 one says, A shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse. That's the father of David, out of David's line. A branch from his roots will bear fruit. That's the Messiah coming through the Jesse's line through David. And the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. This is prophetic. The Spirit of God is going to come on the root of David, the, the, the line of David, and that's Jesus. Isaiah 42.1, we read that earlier. Do you remember it? Behold my servant whom I am uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. Those are prophecies. The Messiah would have the full presence and power of the Holy Spirit on them. It's what John 3.34 says, that God gave Jesus the spirit. And this is the key phrase. How? Without measure. Jesus has the Spirit of God without measure, without limitation. The Spirit of God is anointed upon him. Here's the way Barclay said it. Jesus' baptism was a moment of decision. Time for Jesus to decide, am I going to do this or not? Secondly, it was a moment of identification. Jesus comes out of the closet in that sense, in a positive way, right? All right, we're going to let everybody know it now. This is the Messiah. John's going to say, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. It's a moment of approval. God says, This is my 
wonderful, loving son. The, the word there that sometimes is most often translated beloved is also translated only. It's, he's so beloved because he's the only one. He's the special one. He's his son. And he says, I'm going to affirm him right now for all to hear. And it was a moment of equipment. The Holy Spirit comes on Jesus and equips him for the ministry that he has ahead. So here's my question. What does this all mean to us? Some of you are bored right now, right? Okay, this is all about Jesus, right? But what's this mean to us? That Jesus was identified as the Messiah, that Jesus was baptized? What's that mean to us? Well, let me give you an illustration from Ray Steadman. He tells a story about a grandfather who entered his child's bedroom and a wide grin brightened the little kid's face. And, and, he, and he says, Davy! And, and he said, spreading his arms for a big hug. And Davy hollers out, Grandpa! And he shrieks to his delighted two-year-old from his playpen. And, and Grandpa picks him up and starts hugging him. Sure, I'll give you a hug, Davy, said the grandpa. And with that, the old man reached out to his grandson, scoops him out of the playpen, snuggling the boy in his strong arms. After a big hug, the grand grandfather sets the boy down outside the playpen among his toys, and they begin to play together. Minutes later, the boy's mother walks into the room. Davy, you know I put you in the playpen because you've been naughty. You shouldn't have let grandpa take you out. Hmm. Davy's eyes start to puddle up. His tears start to form. He begins to cry. Grandfather instantly felt terrible. He didn't know that Davy was in trouble and was being disciplined, and that's why he's put inside the playpen. He just wanted to let's give him his love. Now Davy, back in the playpen, cries out, Grandpa, play with me. The mother is unbending. Davy, you know you have to be in the playpen right now. So she had picked him up and placed him there for his solitary confinement. The boy wails in despair. Now what's Grandpa do? He got the little boy in trouble and he's made things worse for him. And Grandpa had an idea. Suddenly the mom looks and says, Dad, what are you doing? Because Grandpa's climbing inside the playpen. <laughs> And joining little Davy for his solitary confinement. And his response was, honey, I'm doing the only thing I can do. The child was being punished, and that was rightfully so. The only way the father could show mercy to the boy was by descending to Davy's situation and taking Davy's punishment on himself. Folks, that's what Jesus has done for you and me. Why is the baptism significant? Because Jesus got into our playpen where we were in solitary confinement. And he's offering us his love. He's doing what no one else could do. He's taken the punishment on himself for us. So what does the baptism mean to us? Uh, again, quoting John McCarthy, he says, here's the cry of the prophet's heart. Oh, that you would rip the heavens and come down. That's Isaiah 64, 1, where it's, again, it's another prophecy that the Holy Spirit's going to rip open heaven and God's going to come down and ascend on the Messiah. And, and our, our prayer is that, that God would rip open the heavens and come down and make his name known. This is the anticipation of Messiah. The day is going to come when the silent heavens are going to rip open and God is going to come back. Isaiah 9 said, there will be no more gloom for her who... Oops, now I want to skip that one, sorry. It was just about Galilee and it's a whole thing that, that, that God, God did what to Galilee? He took an, a totally dirty place, a forgotten place, a place where there were foreigners, and he made it the place where Jesus did his ministry. But here's the text I want to give you to conclude with. <clears throat> Galatians 4, verses 4 to 7. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. That means to buy us back. So that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father, dear Daddy. So you are no longer a slave, but a son and if a son, then an, heir, then an heir through God. 
Jesus' baptism pictures death and resurrection, and Romans 6 invites us then to take on that same baptism. The death of Christ, we were buried with him as he died for our sins. And the resurrection of Christ, we are risen up out of the water as just as Christ rose for us to set us free. Folks, baptism, it's an identification with what Christ did for us. It's an act we do in obedience, submission, and humility. And so Peter, in his great sermon to the church, says, repent. Repent. Turn from the direction you're going. And be baptized. Identify yourself with Jesus Christ. It's like Jesus. Maybe some of you have been need to make a turn and say, it's time to repent and really give my life to following Jesus, to begin my ministry for Jesus, to pursue him with everything. Because God wants to light on you. God wants to affirm you. God wants to forgive you. And God wants to empower you to do his will. What does Jesus' baptism mean to you? Father, some of us have not been affirmed very well in life and because of that it's hard for us to believe and receive affirmation. It's hard to believe we're loved. It's, it's hard to give affirmation. Uh, and Lord, what, a, what an incredible thing you did. You showed your love and affirmation to your son as he began his earthly ministry. And Jesus, I thank you that you continue to want to show love and affirmation to us today as we are obedient, as we repent, as we submit. You want to pour out that same love and affirmation on us. Call us your sons. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, I pray that we would not be afraid of the repentance we may need to do. But instead, we'd look forward to the forgiveness, to the cleansing that you want to give, to the affirmation that you want to pour out. Jesus, set us free to be your disciples and to go and make disciples. Where we commit ourselves to following you. In Jesus' name, amen.